Hello everybody and welcome to Mongoose Gaming today. We are going to be doing a retrospective view on our take for Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Um, haven't uploaded the podcast in a while so I figured this would be a good one as today is uh, at the time of recording, July 16th. This is the two year anniversary of Off the Wall Nerds podcast that Justin and I started. Um, we are currently in season two of our podcast. I know it sounds kind of weird um, but just the way he and I have been doing it, uh, kind of working through the stuff and uh, having some fun um again justin's not with me but again this is going to be a special episode um this is episode four of season two and again we're talking about tears of the kingdom doing a retrospective look at it now a lot of streamers have done this already a lot of youtube content creators um about how good tears of the kingdom is how its impact is how its impact is on the franchise and is it better than breath of the wild is it better than most of the other zelda games of the franchise there are 29 zelda game entries in the entire franchise so i'm gonna say it's definitely top five um, at least personally for me but we're gonna go over a few things like um you know ganondorf being back as you can see here i have a little slideshow going we're gonna talk about the timeline the way the temples are the shrines the time gap between breath of the wild tears of the kingdom and the rest of the timeline and of course weapon fusion stuff like that um basic fun stuff now this game i've already literally no joke logged over 500 hours on it um we're not gonna do that deep a dive this is like a review in a sense of how well i think it's held up over the past year compared to breath of the wild which was released seven years ago so this is going to be biased but at the same time i would appreciate some feedback so guys leave likes comments uh subscribe follow you know i really appreciate the interaction this is uh my I, as of now i'm at 217 subscribers on youtube i really genuinely appreciate the support ever since i uploaded the my latest videos with the uh, ambassador video and then uploading the buzzwall solo video i've gained al almost 30 subscribers so i really appreciate the support guys i i'm assuming you guys enjoy the content so i'm gonna just keep going with it again this is just for fun but now we got that kind of stuff out of the way so we're going to talk about tears of the kingdom obviously so um personally for me i'll start off with this it is my favorite zelda game of all the zelda games that have been released and as far as favorite video games go of all time that I've played in my life, it is definitely up there with Gears of War 3. It is up there with Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Yes, I'm going to go there. Uh, Jurassic World Evolution. So Tears of the Kingdom is definitely a game. While I have not yet logged as many hours on Tears of the Kingdom as I did Breath of the Wild, um, take into account I did 630 hours in Breath of the Wild in seven years. Tears of the Kingdom, it's barely been a year and I'm approaching 500. There's definitely more to do in Tears of the Kingdom. Um, so again, I will go over some of the, some of the you know drawbacks of it, um, but definitely there have been very, very good improvements. So um, also, if you're, you guys are enjoying the music, um, this is uh, from a channel. I, what's the name of the channel? I'm looking at it right now. It just says Chill and Relax Sounds, but it says Copyright Free Music. So I'm using it uh, to kind of give a obviously Zelda feel. So if I get a DMCA strike, oops, I will change the music and probably have to re-upload this video. Uh, so Tears of the Kingdom. Starts off, I will say, same as, same as Breath of the Wild. Link is hurt. Link is in some sort of resurrection chamber, awakening room, however you want to call it. Gets help from a oh, perfect slide entrance right there with King Raru. So it was... Uh, it was a fun game. I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm still playing it. I had actually wanted to play it during this but um, I ran into screen capture issues and I was like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to deal with that. <laughs> so um, I did this little slideshow and just kind of going off of uh, a little script I wrote, talking points. So um, right off the bat, they hit us with Ganondorf is back. And I will say this is like probably the most terrifying we've seen Ganondorf. Like absolutely terrifying when they find his body down below. Um basically imprisoned and the source of like all the gloom and i will say calamity also like the you know the calamity ganon happened in, uh, in breath of the wild and then the hundred years that had passed link, link being passed out so this is definitely a worthy sequel um so i like that ganon has been brought back ganon is terrifying and he is just as good as an antagonist as he is in twilight princess and ocarina of time he has that um he has that he has that confidence in him and then of course at the same time though 
just absolutely terrifying. Again, when you keep using that word, but he's a villain. He is hands down the best villain in the franchise. And honestly, as far as iterations go, this is the best version of Ganondorf we've had personally for me since Twilight Princess and Wind Waker. Um, while I didn't like the animation of Wind Waker, Ganondorf in Wind Waker was genuinely uh, scary. He had very poignant moments. Same with Ganondorf in Twilight Princess. It's just like, you know, they did really, really well with nailing the character's story. And in Tears of the Kingdom with Ganondorf, I'd argue we see Demise. Like, Ganondorf turns into Demise. Like, when you fight, um, when he gets the Secret Stone after he kills Sonya, and when he uses it in the final battle, that is Demise. I know it says Demon King Ganondorf, however it puts it, but um, it, uh, it definitely is Demise. So it's like we kind of get all three, like, these versions of Ganondorf, Ganon, Ganondorf, and Demise. I would argue Ganon is the dragon because Ganon is usually referred to his changed form outside of like, you know, humanoid person type thing. Um, we, of course, then we get the gloom and the way the gloom works in the kingdom, uh, old and new enemies alike. Now, I say old and new when genuinely all the enemies in this game are from every previous Zelda entry, from Wizrobes to the Gleox to the Lynels to the Bokoblins. Every single enemy has been in the game previously, and that's totally okay. You know, you get to reuse the enemies and get to look at something like a Gleok. I think the last time we saw Gleok was Legend of Zelda or Zelda 2. Definitely, definitely way, way, way back. Um, but now the Gleoks are, <laughs> Gleoks are terrifying um, and very hard to take down if you don't know what you're doing. But even when you do, it's kind of not worth it. Again, something I'll get into maybe later. Um, but Bokoblins are back. They're a little more. They're obviously more formed. They got full horns. Mo that, and again, that goes on the Moblins. Um, then they have. I forgot. Wow, I forgot the name. But the Bokoblin bosses, and of course, um, the Stal Bokoblins. They all. They all have their horns now. And then Lionels. I would. I would argue Lionels didn't change much, but Lionels are still fun. And definitely my most fun enemy to take down because, why not? <laughs> In Breath of the Wild, it was actually fairly easy to take a Lionel. In Tears of the Kingdom, it's, I'd argue it's even easier, um, especially with some of the weapons you get to use and all that. Um, but that's kind of a quick rundown of that. Again, enemy-wise, I love it. Uh, there's a shot of Ganon, Ganondorf right there. Like, again, just they, I feel they nailed it. Um, kind of going into temples and bosses. Uh, four temples, just like Breath of the Wild. Overall, four bosses. Um and yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty great like i the temples are definitely better than breath of the wild um at least versus the four ver the four v four so the divine v wow divine beasts versus what we have in like the sky islands and all that um i would definitely argue tears of the kingdom takes the cake on that one um the exploration factor was definitely back in that the puzzles were back so i i, I thoroughly enjoyed the the temples better in tears of the kingdom um and as far as like mini bosses go, like so, there's the bosses like Kogera, uh, Marbled Goma, stuff like that. But then the mini, uh, the mini bosses like the Gleox, and of course the halfway bosses. Those, <laughs> those are great. Um, I'd say Gibdos are genuinely a little terrifying. Um, the Queen Gibdo definitely threw me for a loop when we were fighting it, and I'm just like, wow, okay. It it just uh, threw me for a loop because you have to use Riju. Um, Shock fruits didn't work that great, so you definitely had to use your uh, your heroes there or your champions, however they call them now. Um, so yeah, it was pretty. It was, again, temples and bosses were a lot of fun, um, and of course now the like the addition. So the overall thing feel of Tears of the Kingdom, we have Sky Islands and the depths. So basically, on the same console, seven years apart, um, Nintendo tripled the size of Breath of the Wild and kept it on a single cartridge with no expansion needed and amazingly did it like they're geniuses over there um way more to explore I thought I had been I thought I got like all the named places I'm still finding shit now I'm not a completionist I think Breath of the Wild I'm like 55% quite literally like you know I just go to beat the game have some fun Tears of the Kingdom did the same thing, but without really trying it. Tears of the Kingdom already at 70%, which is actually kind of scary for me, because I'm like, I didn't try. 
The last 30%, I'm 99% sure is a combination of Koroks and named places. I want to say it's also many of the Koroks because I've only found about 200. And I've already maxed out my bow storage. I don't use shields other than the Hylian shield. And my weapon storage is almost maxed. So I'm literally probably about max, if you will, on what I want as far as Koroks go. Um, but as far as like the map, I knew the overworld map of the overworld i knew like the back of my hand so like when i started playing i knew where i wanted to go even without the towers being active i knew where was what and who was where stuff like that as soon as i got down from the sky islands i was like okay i know where i'm going um but the depths the depths was challenging um i appreciate that that it was completely pitch black so you had you really had to use the seed blooms like they made you use stuff because i don't collect stuff if, um i don't i haven't posted a lot of my playthrough but um well, thing that irks Leia is that I don't collect anything. When I kill an enemy, I just leave the stuff that I don't collect anything unless it's like absolutely 100% useful to me. Uh, like hunting a lionel and taking its horn, I'll use that because then I can fuse it to a weapon. Um, but the depths were a lot of fun. Um, again, scary and like, and basically challenging. Like the Frox is down there. Once you beat the temple bosses and the bosses are down there, um, basically I think there's three of each or three, three of each or like two of each, but they're all down there at least twice. You, you can find them at certain places. Um, so you can find Goma, Kolgara, um, and you know just kind of go from there. The water temple boss. So, um, yeah, it, it, it the depths is were challenging um i will argue the uh sky islands not that bad um it was a lot of once you build the hover bike you can get to any of the sky islands no issue even the ones for the temples and all that but it was a lot of fun and of course you come across king gliox three of them those i will i i hate king gliox because <laughs> at least with other gliox you can kind of fly above them <laughs> A King Gliok, you have to really get up in the air. Um, and it takes a while, like on the hover bike. So it, it can take a while just to climb that height and then just to jump off and attack it. So I have defeated all the Gliok's. It's not an enemy I go back to. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, like, as far as mini bosses go, that's great. Um, and of course, we have the shrines. Now, in Breath of the Wild, there's 120. Um, there are 152 here in Tears of the Kingdom. I believe there's an increase in overall hearts because it's still just a triple stamina wheel, but you get more hearts this time around or have the ability to get more hearts this time around. Uh, the shrines, just like Breath of the Wild, this isn't a diss. It's just they were forgettable. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Just I did them, done. Um, unlike a lot of people, I don't go back into them to be like, oh, I can do this better or I can do this faster. Once, once I'm done, I do not go back into that shrine. Um, they have the equivalency. They have the equivalency of like you know the test of strength or whatever, and those are fun. Um, fighting the Zonite guardians, I would call them. They're not, of course they're not evil. They're just programmed differently. So the Sea Link is an enemy. Of course, Raru acknowledges this when you first meet him. Um, but definitely a lot more shrines. Again, only forgettable because 152 of them, even 120 of them, I'm not gonna remember all of them. Um, I, so I wouldn't be able to say, oh, this is my favorite shrine, or this is my favorite shrine. No no shot. <laughs> but um, it was fun to get through them. I initially didn't actually do them all before, hand quote-unquote, beating the game. But then I went ahead and just found them all and beat them. And then, of course, I got the uh, the full Zonite armor, which I haven't maxed out yet. Um, but that's, that's what you get for the shrines. Now, as far as rewards go... Um, Breath of the Wild definitely had the take in the cake with best reward for shrines. When you beat uh, Maz Koshia, Ko I believe that's how I'm saying it correctly, to get the Master Cycle Zero. I don't care what you can fuse in this game, what you can build. The Master Cycle Ma Master Cycle Zero, whatever, how, however, I, I forget, but that is the epitome of just like absolute great transportation in the games. <laughs> um, basically a dirt bike, easy to fuel up call in a moment's notice and just take off i love it i miss it it's great um the hover bike is of course the close second but nothing else at the same time i would put like having a great horse right there too um epona's a default number one number two i do have it didn't take me long 
I have a couple of the best horses in the game. You know, it's like it's a four four five and I believe a five three five in terms of star rating. But yeah, I don't care what you have. Breath of the Wild took the cake on rewards for shrines. Now the Zonite armor you get in Tears of the Kingdom maxed out absolutely blasts your battery life. Like you once you double your battery life. You get the zone armor max it out it basically is almost triple it acts like a third level of battery life because then you use the hub like even just using it level one you notice a significant loss of you okay i don't I'm, I'm not saying that right but you just notice that you use less power so i'm like that's pretty great and once you i have again i have max it out personally but i know once you do that's going to be pretty great um and i have seen plenty of people who've maxed it out and it's great um, it does. It provides a great defensive buff. It is very much it is the highest rated armor in the game at 84 once it's maxed out. And uh, beating out the Ocarina Time Suit and the Fierce Deity armor at 60 apiece. So there's that. Um, as far as now, kind of going back. The, this is going to be a little more, more random stuff before I really get into the last few points I want to make. And again, this is only 16 minutes. I don't want to bore everybody. And again, 500 hours of gameplay. Not going to go over all that. Um, there is a lot of... T there's still there's always something to do in Tears of the Kingdom. I do Lionel hunting um, because I want to make sure I have a few weapons here and there. But once you actually beat the game and your challenge is to go face Ganondorf however many times you want to face Ganondorf, because you technically don't lose the weapons because like every Zelda game before and most likely after you don't lose anything you save it before the boss fight and then whatever happens to the boss fight doesn't matter because you go back to the that one save spot before Ganondorf so you you can go in I've seen Ganondorf beaten in as few as hold on let me see I, I, I one two three four I've seen Ganondorf beaten as few as four hits Oh, wait, one, two, three, four. Sorry. Six hits. And then, of course, the dragon form, you have to take out three of the things. So the, at, at most, it's what? Two plus four plus three or four. So less than ten hit. I mean, and I mean, sing, one single hit per damage strike kind of thing. Like, you just ten strikes. And I've seen people take them out that fast. That's because of the bone proficiency uh, with, a, with a Phantom Ganon armor. I have used it. It is flippin' amazing. Um... To sit there and take out a Lionel in four hits. To sit there and if you have the right weapons, fuse, which is the Royal Guard Sword or Royal Guard Claymore on its last strike. Fuse it with a Moldugo Jaw, Phantom Ganon Armor. When you throw it at that point, it's like four times damage. I don't know the exact multiplier, but I just know it does an insane amount of damage. And a weapon does more damage when you throw it. And because the Royal Guard weapons says the massive destructive power up for it breaks so that one last strike has like again four times the damage you throw it it's another four times two or four times so that's why ganon if you wear the phantom ganon armor and you have like eight of those weapons on their final strike with multiple jaws you're gonna flat out beat ganondorf in six or seven hits like no joke um, you just throw the weapon at him because he, while he dodges strikes and defends himself, if you do it right, just time in like a couple seconds, throw each weapon, he's done. Um, I like to have fun, so I just, I traditionally, I go in kind of the traditional way. I'll wear the Ocarina Time Armor or the Fierce Deity Armor, which is my favorite armor set across all of Legend of Zelda. Um, go in with a powered up Master Sword or even one of the, even one of the Royal Guard weapons that's just ready to go that isn't about to break. But I like that actually going in with a fierce CD armor and the Gerudo Scimitar with a Lionel, uh, with a silver Lionel horn. That's 130 damage right there, plus the fierce CD armor. You still will take out Ganondorf fairly quickly. Um, as far as other enemies, like, you know, the bows are great. Um, I, weapon durability has always been a point of contention with me as with other Zelda fans. I hate that they break. I feel the Master Sword should technically never run out of energy. Um, that is one thing that bugs me a little bit. Um, I feel bows. I, I mean, I get why bows break, but I feel like one of the like the ones you have to keep making over and over again, like or whatever. You shouldn't have to be you know, like the great eagle bow should have been one of those. Okay, never breaks, but still let it light on fire or something to where if you drop it, you lose it type thing. I get that. Again, weapon durability has been kind of meh. Um, master sword should have never run out of energy again, but. 
but I, I get why they did it more variety of weapons, but then you get to a point where you're like, okay, I have enough variety of weapons. <laughs> Um, or certain weapons like the fierce deity sword, fierce deity sword. Anything you could have gotten from like amiibos shouldn't break, because the pain it is. But they kind of fix that because once you get it, you go to the bargainer statues and you get your big Goron sword back. You get the fierce deity sword back, and so on and so forth. They, they, they do make it easier to get those special weapons back. Um, so that's that's been kind of a, kind of an alleviation, if you will. Um, and kind of rolling back to on topic uh, to kind of maybe close this out hopefully <laughs> again um tears of the kingdom there's been a lot of talk about the time gap between breath of the wild and tears of the kingdom um i don't i forget what the official hyrule historia timeline says but i want to say at minimum five years but as much as 10 years have passed between breath of the wild and tears of the kingdom and the reason i say that is actually because of one character in one character specifically that's Hudson. So when you meet Hudson, he barely gets married in Tears of uh, Tears in uh, Breath of the Wild with no kid. You come to Tears of the Kingdom, he now is happily married and has a daughter that is off on off to go on her own with the Gerudo to learn their ways because she is, I believe, eight or eight, nine or ten years old. I mean, she's between the ages of eight and ten. That's my sort of sticking point that eight years have passed since Breath of the Wild. Because I will give the I will give the you know the people credit. They they paid attention to previous game and all that. So Hudson has a daughter that's like eight again, like eight to ten years old, and that's I that's kinda like my foot in the door right there. Like that's how much time has passed. Um Link's hair has also changed. Zelda has gone from long hair to short hair. Other things that have also changed, like you see, like the divine beasts are gone, all the ancient guardian technologies, and you would think you would think after a few years it would take some time to get rid of all that because cleanup crews, you know, you get them out there, and then all of a sudden the upheaval happens, is what they refer to it as. So, um, and that actually happens fairly quickly. Like the upheaval happens, and Link isn't gone for a hundred years, so everybody remembers who he is because I think at most what a couple days, you know, so. People are like, oh, they, we lost Zelda and Link, but then Link comes back. Oh, we found Link. So I'll say safely between five and ten years. I'm going to stick with like eight to ten just because of Hudson's daughter um, being as old as she is and off to go on her own to learn the ways of her people in the Gerudo town. Now, one of my favorite things is trying to figure out where Tears of the Kingdom occurs on the timeline. There are three separate timelines. There is the hero... Oh, I went, sorry, the child and adult timelines and then were the one where the adult hero fails that happened in Ocarina of Time. Um, Ocarina of Time split the timeline into three where Link goes in the future, defeats Ganon, comes back as a kid. There's the kid timeline. Then there's the adult hero timeline where he doesn't go back. Then there's the adult hero timeline where he loses. Um, officially... And the Hyrule Historia Breath of the Wild occurs at the very, very end of all three timelines, but it doesn't show it like at the end of any specific branch. Um, Breath of the Wild is said to is literally says ten thousand years later. So the trick there is okay, not so much trick, but just to kind of figure it out is my belief is that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom are the la are are dead last in the timeline. At some point between the last game in the uh, last three games at each timeline to breath of the wild there was a, had to have been some sort of convergence if you will of timelines to then make breath of the wild because if you look at breath of the wild and tears of the kingdom every all previous 27 entries of the legend of zelda are referenced in these two games from enemies to drawings of the walls to names of characters to references of the heroes of time to past Zelda lineages, uh, the kings of Hyrule, kings and queens, stuff like that. So, and I, I get it. It's also fun Easter eggs. Like, you know, oh, you find we found all 27 Easter eggs you could in Breath of the Wild for every previous game before it. Cool. But at the same time, I feel Nintendo is very meticulous. Like, okay, they did this. So what I have been saying for the past year, and I know Leia's getting tired of hearing me saying it, but... It's just when I go on YouTube, watch other videos from like Zeltic, for instance, or Nintendo Crisis, um, where they've done their own theories. And Zeltic, no, not to diss the other content creators out there for Zelda, but Zeltic is like number one for me uh, as far as like that goes. 
But um, for me, Tears of the Kingdom shot the entire timeline in the face. The reason I say that is because when Zelda goes back in time, like when she falls and her ta- and her secret stone, essentially, or whatever power she has, kicks in, she's warped back to the very first days of Hyrule. And we come across King Raru and Queen Sonya. Uh, Sonya, who is very much not looking like a typical Hylian like Zelda is. And then, of course, Raru, who is Zonai. And at this time, again, thousands of years in the past, Raru and his sister are the last two Zonai. So the Zonai have literally been extinct for tens of thousands of years. We go back to the past and there's only two left. So we still have a huge mystery with the Zonai. As much as we did get a history on them or like what the Zonai have done, what the Zonai are since we see them, or at least since, since we see Raru and Minoru, it, we're still in a, in a mystery. Now, Raru does, de- again, perfect segue right here in my little slide. Raru ends up defeat- being able to defeat Ganondorf, at least imprison him in the imprisoning war. So, but we get a lot of flashbacks of the memories of Ganondorf coming around and we get a very much Ocarina of Time vibe where he pledges his fealty to Raru and very, very callbacky to Ocarina of Time where Ganondorf does the same thing with Zelda's father in that game. So not the first time Ganondorf has planned to stab someone in the back. And of course, Raru is very much aware of this. Like Ganondorf pledges, pledges his fealty and as he leaves, Zelda tries to warn him because Zelda knows what happens. But Robert's like, I know. He goes, we have to keep up. He, he pulls the whole enemies closer uh, stick. You know, like, he doesn't say it, but you keep your enemies closer. Um, so that's what he planned to do with Ganondorf. And we get some amazing uh, visuals uh, with Ganondorf sending Moldulgas after Raru. He stops them. Nice little Easter eggs. If you blink and miss it, you get uh, Kome and Kotaku. The women who raised Ganondorf, you see them behind him in their traditional colors, at least I believe on their eyes. But you, if you pay attention, you actually do see them behind him. Uh, who later, of course, become Twin Rova and Talker at a time. Again, this is all the memories we see. Well, at least with Ganondorf and Zelda back in time, again, tens of thousands of years in the past. To the Again, the first days of Hyrule. So we have to wonder, him being the first king of Hyrule, is this literally at the same time as Skyward Sword... Or is this before Skyward Sword? Because Hyrule technically still does exist in Skyward Sword. That's what Link jumps down into when he has to go rescue Zelda. So that's one of those things we have to kind of wonder about. Like, okay, again, shooting the timeline in the face is going to be my favorite analogy. With Zelda going back in time, she literally changes everything. Now... Sonya still dies, Raru still dies. But if we kind of look at it from perspective of a fan, everything was kind of copacetic until Zelda goes back. All of a sudden, the Master Sword has been damaged at beyond present repair, beyond present, um, or beyond repair in present, sorry. So in which Zelda uses her power to try to communicate with Link in the future, in which we as Link are able to send the Master Sword back in time because we get the whole Master Sword gains power the further the longer it sits it is able to restore itself and become stronger and stronger the longer it sits and so longer basically the longer it sits i'm sorry not like in a stone particularly but just the longer it rests so um the master sword ends up getting repaired of course we find out that eating a secret stone turns you into a dragon and it opens up another can of worms once mineral lets that out for roar Din and um, Nehru are all dragons. We have for Roche, Din Rol, and Nadra. And now it makes you think that these three goddesses eat their secret stones and become dragons. Again, this is a can of worms that Tears of the Kingdom is opening up. So it merely makes us think, like, wait, what the hell? So I firmly believe they ate their secret stones and now they have been wandering, wandering aimlessly through time at least the last 10,000 years. Because, of course, we don't get the dragons in any previous game, but Nehru, uh, Nehru, Din, and Furor are all mentioned in Ocarina of Time as the three who created Hyrule, along with the Triforce and Hylia. So, Skyward Sword still remains first in chronological order, but I would argue Tears of the Kingdom is both first and last because of what Zelda had to do. 
Now, of course, Skyloft is heavily mentioned in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom because when you go into or near Hebra, the Sky Temple's on the ground. It's a, that's what kind of, I would assume that's what caused that canyon is the Sky Temple falling. And that is the, that is the Sky Temple that Link and Zelda are in the Skyloft. So, and of course the giant Hylia statue in which she grants you the, uh, oh my God. The uh, God the sword, goddess sword. I can't remember. I have to look it up. Anyway, the sword that becomes the master sword. She hands you that one. Of course, for the, for returning a piece of each dragon. So from Dinral, Feroche, and Nadra, you have to give her a claw of each. But you have to essentially return the three goddesses to Hylia, and she grants you the goddess or the goddess of the sky sword or whatever. And so it kind of makes you sit there like, okay, this is kind of coming full circle. Again, could it be Easter eggs? Who knows? But digging into it as hardcore fans as we are, <laughs> it just really sits the, it gives us a solid story to really look into. Um, but it's been, it's been really great playing this game. Again, I'm approaching 500 hours. If I combine Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, I'm well over 1,100 hours combined. That's just, uh, that's just, sad i know um the only other game i've hit a thousand hours on was call of duty but that only is because i played multiplayer in call of duty so if we go by like rpg story mode thousand plus hours i think i the next closest game as far as that is probably gonna be pokemon and that's either soul silver or sword so yeah <laughs> but uh tears of the kingdom for me is the quintessential zelda game now by all means people have their favorites um Leia's favorite is Twilight Princess. My used to be Ocarina of Time, but that's now Tears of the Kingdom. That's my now number one favorite. I know people who love Phantom Hourglass. I know people who love Link to the Past. I know people who love um, Spirit Tracks. Yeah, just go with it. <laughs> but there are 29 games in the franchise. Um, Tears of the Kingdom for me again is, of course, the ultimate one. And honestly, Nick, I would say, has the best Ganondorf battle of all the Zelda games. Um, Ocarina's, Ocarina of Time was a lot of fun. Twilight Princess, I loved because you got to fight on horseback. You got to s actual sword duel. You know, lock swords, that kind of thing. You had to really pay attention. Um, Link to the Past Ganondorf fight was a lot of fun. But I, ending on that one with Ganondorf, the Ganondorf fight is like, you come up to him, he resurrects himself, and just menacing i know it's, and it says menace unleashed but is absolutely terrifying and menacing to see him just jump down and be like that is what a king must do or you know that it rules his new kingdom and he goes that's what a king must do he goes you witness a king's revival pull and 100 percent like a samurai uh pulls out his sword correctly you know the thumb and then slides it out properly and it was genuinely fun and like a lot of people the first time around i didn't record it i wasn't smart enough or aware enough to do that but when i played and i began over the first stage like he looks right right here granted right here he's using a secret stone that slide but he looks like that after you beat him and then becomes demise his health bar going through the roof I sat there and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? What the fuck is going on? Like every, but every video you've seen of somebody freaking out over that health bar going way past where it should have been, that was me also. Like <laughs> just all of us at once sitting like, what the hell is it stopping? And that's where I actually, I, that's where actually where I almost died my first time. I didn't die the first time around I beat him. I almost did it because I was so distracted by the health bar. I literally almost lost the fight the first time around. So I was kind of like, oops, <laughs> but I beat it. It was very, very refreshing. I got the, I hate how they call it the true ending. All these videos say the true ending. I got the ending of the game where it shows that um, Minoru then goes back. Like she is able to rest herself, thus ending the, thus ending there. No more Zonai. She's the last one. Um, So kind of ending the video here. Not okay. Not ending the video, but going into like my, my ending here so tears of the kingdom unlike calamity ganon with uh breath of the wild because there's still so much you see to do in breath of the wild like they have to get rid of the ancient technology because they can't trust it 
there's still questions looming because they do mention like what's under the castle stuff like that tears of the kingdom felt very very finalish much the way ocarina of time did like okay this is it we're done um i really hope nintendo does release a threequel i would love love for this to be a trilogy and a trilogy that would absolutely rock the core of the franchise and fandom that if we were to bring anyone back or to like how would you do it again bring us back to hyrule bring it use this map for a third time keep the depths keep the sky islands there keep the map the way it is like if there's you know like if hudson builds more houses totally cool but i would love to see keeping this map where you can still go down below the chasms the chasms then fill up you know like you can still go down to the depths but then now maybe hylians have um uh oh my god colonized down there maybe they're living down there now like that sort of thing because i would love to see the trilogy end with one more boss fight i was pitching this to leia and again i know people have their own theories this isn't trying to me be an expert and say my theory is the best but my want my theory would be to see one last fight between the ultimate hero and link the ultimate villain and demise slash ganondorf and zelda and that the fight ends the curse demise put on the lineage of himself and link that he said that there will always be um the the cur your line is always cursed there will always be someone like me to fight you there will always be someone like you around no matter what that every incarnation will have to fight me and i would love to see that demise comes back with an end all be all that he lifts the curse only to return and sit there and be like this ends and you know this ends here type thing where win or lose like demise wins that's it the game ends like that would be that you know if avengers infinity war status thanos snapping the glove and us sitting there like what the fuck just happened like i mean end it there be ballsy do it or have you know real in-game world consequences like in gears of war 5 you choose who dies whether it's jd or um jace and those that has real world consequences going forward well they need to do that in the legend of zelda and i feel it should be with the final boss battle that if link wins that's it like kind of end the series there but not end the series there um so let's see here um but do something like that where like you know it really really hurts or really really feels great but it's just something you know i hope you know and we all know i'm sorry no matter what nintendo says they are the most secretive company so when they say oh no we're not working on it we know you're working on it okay no one had a clue echoes of wisdom was coming out it was it was it blew everyone away now personally i'm looking forward to it i don't like the animation um but you get to play a zelda finally <laughs> so there is that um so yeah um but as far as what we're looking into i did turn the music off so it's gonna be a little quiet in the background i apologize but i would love to see something like that like you know breath of the wild tears of the kingdom and whatever snappy you know title they can come up with for the third one because every title i of 29 zelda games i'd say like 20 or so have had some i mean absolute killer titles um i want as far as like what we've seen going forward like what the mcu is doing we've kind of seen previously like godzilla's doing with movies and something like i want zelda i want let's just to avoid that like don't do a yeah how do i put it a avengers assemble with every link beforehand <laughs> but have like this current link our current hero who's now into his 30s or let's see hold on he's i want to say he's 18 in breath of the wild he's still young um if the time goes by the way it should he genuinely should be between 25 and 30 years old so the trilogy the third one should put him into his 40s um and we have seen plenty of story from Nintendo that there is cause to think to see Link as an old man. In one of the stories, he loses his arm. He did lose his arm here. Now he wasn't old. He now, of course, he wasn't an old man in his fifties fighting, but he did lose his arm. So I think the next one should see this this iteration of Link 
as an older man, either raising his kid or, you know, having one last fight in him where he has to go pull the Master Sword one last time to go fight and defeat Demise for the last time. Like, absolutely uh, end it right then and there. You know, that Demise comes back, Hylia is gone, or, like, not the whole kidnap Zelda trope, which I get to use the kingdom credit for. Zelda was not kidnapped. <laughs> but Echoes of Wisdom, spoiler alert, Link is kidnapped. Um, But I would love to see just one more like that to see absolutely a bonkers ending because tears of the kingdom gave us our best ganondorf fight ever um and i don't expect a third one to top that but story-wise overall i would love to see a conclusion that would just absolutely obliterate our brains and liquefy them um so that's kind of been my retrospective i still firmly stand by tears of the kingdom being personally the best in the franchise um, topping Ocarina of Time, topping Twilight Princess, topping Wind Waker, Skyward Sword, Link to the Past, as the quintessential Zelda game. It did not win Game of the Year last year. It was a travesty. Um, it definitely deserved that award. Um, I have no qualms having wasted 500 hours of my life into the game, <laughs> fusing weapons, um, Lionel hunting, exploring and finding new stuff that I didn't think I'd find. Um, so... There's always something new in the game. Um, People who have played a thousand hours are still finding new stuff. There's still, I think there's like literally two or three people in the world who have 100% of the game. So that tells you how hard it is to 100% the game. Um, But I appreciate you guys tuning in. I hope you enjoy this take on Zelda, uh, at least on Cheers of the Kingdom. Um, My whole take on like the timeline where, you know, where it stands, what it is. Again, shooting the entire timeline in the face. Um. So remember, if you guys have lasted this long, again, appreciate the support. Um, leave a like, follow, subscribe, comment. Let me know what you guys think. Um, I'm loving the interaction the last few videos. I love talking to the people who comment um, because it, may, it helps me improve. And at the same time, you guys ask questions. I definitely have the answers to. Um, I try to reply as quick as possible. So um, remember, all my socials down below. Well, not down below. Just click the YouTube link or whatever link you're clicking. It'll be there. So appreciate you guys tuning in. I will, uh, yeah, I don't know. So, again, two years since we launched the podcast. This will be the two-year anniversary episode, and hopefully we I will get Justin back at some point. Um, but, again, guys, I appreciate you tuning in. I will do be, I will be doing a GoFest 2024 review uh, for the Pokemon Go game. Uh, probably come up here soon. Uh, until then, guys, take it easy. I'll see you on the next video, and, again, thank you for tuning in.